Okay, let's uh, explore some new features, or rather some features we haven't uh, taken a close look at um, for a while. Uh, namely, under the window menu, there are a number of uh, features such as the penny paint and uh, a whole category of color, utilities and other items here that um, I'm going to review. And I'll start with penny paint right here just to uh, show that there is actually another paint program inside this paint program, so to speak, and Penny is a, a little paint program of its own, and uh, it has uh, it's a spline-based uh, paint engine, and it has um, some interesting features that will particularly interest you if you're doing cartoon drawings. So enough said, this is something that you may want to explore as well. When you close it, it will automatically put a copy of the image back into Dogwaffle. Um, let's see what else we've had here. Uh, color. There is a color picker called Dogwaffle Color Picker. Now what happens with that is that you, you get to choose different presets. And these presets will then affect the layout or the content of these other color pickers that you have here. So for instance, if you want to do uh, RGB, you'll see the RGB layout. And if you want a different theme, or yet another one for fine arts and oils, and maybe some soft pastel flesh tones, uh, you see you can choose these colors now and, and then start working with them also here uh, through the other color pickers. So <coughs> this is sort of a, a tool you can use to perhaps give you a general theme of uh, predefined colors that can be very useful if you want for instance some warm and deep colors and um, you know start painting away with them all right so that's that one let's have a look at the next one window color colors by name that's another feature too um, if you if you want to pick your colors by a given name uh, you can find them all here so Prussian green or Iridian, cobalt blue, cad, I guess that's cadmium, cadmium red, uh, yellow deep, all of these um, you know, basically named colors. And you can pin this down. Many times these floating windows will uh, stay if you decide you want to, to keep them there for a long while. Let's see what else. We have uh, color by name. We just did palette mixer. All right, so the palette mixer is uh, one. You can also, by the way, many of these tools, you can also find them in other uh, convenient places, such as here on the color. You can find perhaps options there. And there you'll see uh, pretty much the same menu here with the uh, open the dog waffle color picker, colors by name, and uh, a few others. So there is a um, a color mixer that you can open up, and in fact you can open more. You can have a few of those at the same time. So let's say you want to work with two or three color pickers. Uh, here's the palette mixer. And the reason why we call it the mixer is that you can not only pick the colors that are already there, you can also mix them, and there is a, a little paintbrush here to start mixing the colors. Right, so now you're actually painting in here and mixing these existing colors and you can change the size of this uh, mixer brush. You can also go uh, and undo those changes. Uh, you can also go and load other presets. So let's say we do something that's a little bit more intense, uh, bright, there are some bright colors there. And in this one we'll use uh, perhaps uh, blues and greens. Uh, there's a little bit of other colors there too. Um, let's see, palette one, primary colors, there you go. So we have two different sets here and in either one of those we can start mixing them around to see uh, sort of different blended or uh, combined colors that we can then draw from. So we can uh, go back to the color picker mode, that's this one here, the turkey baster or color picker, and so now we have these colors directly available. All right, so that's that one. And let's move on to the next one. That was the palette mixer. There is another one called the red, yellow, blue picker. And there it is. That's the red, yellow, blue color wheel. And there are 
some uh, interesting features with that as well where you can find perhaps just two main tones like a, a blue two yellow or orange and you can see like here's a red to green and it seems like it's going to basically the complementary color and in, in a number of steps and there's an analogous color set and so you can uh, use that for a variety of um, of color modes that uh, might help you if you're doing some art research or art based uh, art uh, science based uh, paintings um, that's uh, that let's go to the uh, next one there is uh, red yellow blue swatches and that's yet another one that I'm not exactly understanding I'm not an expert in color science but uh, <coughs> we know why we have this in here um, this will definitely be useful for those who know and there will be also a need for system color picker at times that's the Windows system color picker and you can use those to uh, find your colors if you're more familiar with that there are also others there is a hex hexadecimal a hex color picker where you essentially enter the uh, RGB value by a hexadecimal number and you can <coughs> work your way through that so if you enter any sort of values here you don't want green you don't want blue and you now have just some red component and you see it right there um, so there is a great amount of um, color cho choices that's really what I'm trying to, to show here is that there are many different ways to work with your colors there's a color well builder and arranger so that's a tool that can build a color well which you see down here somewhere um, color swatch there I think yeah here you see the color well and you can arrange it in different ways uh, you can blend you can uh, you can swap colors in different ways um, build swatch from image whatever the image is that you have down here so let's say if you have a couple of basic colors here it's going to analyze it and then build a color uh, swatch from the colors found in here and then perhaps interpolate with a few more and then you might want to rearrange it and sort it by the hue by the saturation um, sort it by the rows uh, and so on this is also something that's useful when building gradients from a couple of key colors all right let's go on to the next one here we have uh, just looked at the color wheel builder there's build gradients from colors in buffer now that one will build a gradient so the gradient <coughs> takes a little time there it is and now if we go into the gradient editor um, actually that's not it's a sweep editor that we need to look at uh, sweep there it is um, let's see so we have that tool here um, where was it on the color build gradient from color in buffer right this plugin creates a 256 color palette from the current image and applies it to the current gradient it's not exactly on the fast side well it's fast enough now anyway you see now the gradient has been changed and it's, it contains essentially the whites that we see here a little bit of the greens that we see here some of the bluish that we see here and some reddish but there are many colors in between as well so this might need a little bit of fine tuning such as some smoothing click that a few times or just click and hold it and now you get a little bit more of a transition away from that discrete set of colors uh, and then of course you can also then start changing uh, some specific components the blue part for instance if you want a little bit more blue you go up here and increase it uh, if you want a little bit more green in this side here you can uh, increase it to give you more green saturation and uh, same for the red over red here let's say you want the red to peak at the end here and it's always a good idea to to blend it one more time like that you can also work on the, the opacity with that so you can have uh, fully transparent on the edges and fully opaque in between that too can be smoothed and sometimes you do something other like uh, you add some some gaps here so you have some holes some transparent parts and now where do you see that how do you actually get to see that it's transparent uh, when when you apply it 
Well, it, it, it depends on the tool, but if you have a tool that you're using and that tool is able to um, to make use of the palette or rather of this gradient, uh, such as for instance right here, when you right click on that, there is a circular gradient tool, there's also a linear gradient tool. So these will apply the gradient as you're doing, for instance, a linear fill going like this. See how this gradient is now being used along that path? And you can see that it's transparent because it's not totally overriding the entire image as you do that again and again. You can also use that with the circular gradient tool. There it is. And so you have these circles that are using that gradient with the transparency uh, throughout the the area. If you smooth this a little bit, it will become a little bit more uh, monotone. And that's that. So we have a tool right there to build gradients from the colors that are in the buffer. And then you can also save your color swatch. That's what you see here. Uh, save that uh, to a file. Um, I'm going to just leave that for you to play with. If you have been and digging into the color swatches and you want to save them on a particular file, you can do that too. Now let's have a look at the utilities. So there is <coughs> a, a number, there are a number of tools here. Uh, clear recent list uh, files list. I guess there is a list of files that you can uh, go back to or you can see somewhere. I don't know if it's under the file menu uh, and <coughs> or somewhere else. And you can. Um, yeah, there are recent documents. So what you can do is uh, clear that list if it gets too long. And that's what you do here under the clear recent files list. Let's clear that. And when you go here, recent documents. Oh, no, it's still there. OK. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly why that's so. Um, I'm sure there is a reason. Let's move on to explore temp folder. So there is a temporary folder, a temp folder in which um, dog waffle will uh, keep certain images that it uses while you're working with it these might be um, media uh, brushes that you create and haven't saved yet or as you save them and maybe it puts them there too uh, thumbnail images there's a whole collection of thumbnails from uh, browsing with the, the media browser or with the image browser so uh, sometimes it's interesting to see if there are some images you may want to recover from there or to delete them to uh, get rid of get rid of them and and say get some uh, disk space back because after using the program for a while this may have accumulated to oh I don't know maybe a gigabyte or two gigabytes of disk space or more um, so let's go back to utilities we were here there you go next one is convert an image sequence to an AVI now uh, I'll skip that perhaps for another exploration but if you have a sequence of images you can convert that to an AVI directly so you basically select the images and it will save it to an AVI um, <coughs> that's uh, a nice little utility to to have if you you know for instance if you work with a 3D program and you've saved a, 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 let's say a walk sequence from your 3D character animation program and you have it as a sequence of images or maybe you took a, a sequence of pictures with a camera and or you you did some hand drawn sketches and they are in sequence and now you want to put that into a single file like an AVI file so that would be the convert an image sequence to an AVI and you know what let's just do that so I'm going to uh, find my my uh, let's see where do I go for that program file C uh, I guess I need to find my documents folder or maybe the desktop there it will probably be up here under who am I the owner okay desktop I probably have a shortcut to their presentation there are some uh, image sequences on here I know so let's say for instance uh, human where's my humans there okay I think I have a spinning there there's a spinning astronaut Ooh, but it's not in the right format I'm not seeing it so I don't know maybe it's looking for a file format that I don't have here yeah I and, and I don't know if it's looking for Targa 
Hmm, that is odd. So I'm not sure exactly where to take that. I'll need to refresh my memory on this one here. Okay, um, no, oh, no, that's where I go and save it. Show that will play it after it's been saved. Let's see if I have another, uh, maybe anim brushes. No, I don't, butterflies, PNG, no. Okay, so it evidently it seems to be lacking. Oh, maybe I just, f oh, I think I don't select the files individually. I just select the folder. Probably that's what it is. So let's go and select the, uh, let's go back to my, let's try that with the, um, Oh, there's a running man. That one's a good one. Let's do that. Running man, save AVI, and we will go to the desktop with that. I have the French version here of Windows. Um, and on there, I will go to presentation. And there I can go to, say, where was I here? And in brushes. So there they are. And which uh, folder was that? Running Man. Okay, so I'm going to call this Running Man dot AVI, right? Running Man dot AVI. And make sure I don't have any typos. Oh, that is totally typoed. Dot a Running Man. There you go. Okay, so Running, not Running, Running Man. There you go. Save that. Oh. Hmm. Okay, so that did not quite work. We may have a bug here. Yeah, that does not seem to work. Okay. Um, that is uh, duly noted, and we will have to explore that. <coughs> Let's see <coughs> what else we have. Convert an image sequence to AVI did not work. Average frames. <coughs> That's if you have a number of images in a sequence and you want to kind of get an average in order to get the noise out of there. So let's see if we can simulate that. I'm going to create a, an animation. I'm going to uh, move it a little bit or do some other anima uh, changes to it. <coughs> let's see, for instance, if we transform it with the wave distortion. There you go. Okay, and then we also add a little bit of noise. That would be perhaps from the noise category there. <coughs> or a lot of noise, I don't know, something like this. Let's go render that. So we have very noisy images here. And now I'd like to take one of these images and do an average of this with some of the neighboring images. So window, utilities, average frames to reduce noise. And of course, this one has a lot of noise and it's moving and all that. So that's not going to be perfect. But the idea is to see if we can make it look a little bit cleaner by averaging the neighboring images into a single image. So if let's say if these were actually not moving, but there's just noise, uh, let's say dark camera, dark environment, and you get the the, the noise, um, uh, you know, from one frame to another, uh, taking an average of these frames will make them a little bit cleaner. All right, so that's the idea with that one. And let's move on to the next one. DPI, change DPI of a BMP file. That's if you have a bitmap file, a BMP file somewhere, and you want to set the DPI in the, in its header. Okay, let's go to set wallpaper. So the image you have here, you can turn into your wallpaper. Let's see if that works. Use the current image as the wallpaper. Okay, that. Let's go minimize. Yep, there it is. All right, so we now have a nice, colorful wallpaper. Let's go to Utilities, edit a new Lua script. And Lua browser, both of these kind of go together. So the Lua browser, Lua is a scripting language and you can actually see that we use that here in a number of filters. So you could, uh, you could run some of these filters simply by double clicking the, um, 
double clicking the, the the name of it and now most uh, many of these here were initially put into a lua script and then uh converted into code uh for performance reasons but it's actually very fast already many times you really don't need to do that much more uh, to <coughs> to make it usable you know performance wise the scripts are really really usable and acceptably fast so uh, there is some interesting uh, things to explore here and uh, these scripts some of them uh, we have developed some of them came from um, other sources uh, for instance uh, some users that used the GIMP um, have also found that there is a, a GLUAS uh, GIMP Lua scripting I think it stands for um, capability and so that uh, is what we have here in the Lua browser we have access to some of these uh, Lua scripts. It's a great place to learn Lua also if you want to visually see the effects of changing your parameters. Alright, let's see what else. So edit a new Lua script, that's actually where you go and change or write your code. Alright, let's see the next one under utilities, the widgets. There are a couple of more widgets here. So <coughs> clock, well there it is. It's time to fill up on coffee. Um, six o'clock in the morning. <coughs> let's uh, <laughs> let's go and uh, let's see the next one, widgets, mod player. So that's a music player for fans of the MOD files. That goes back to about 20 years ago, so before MP3. And um, here we have another one, the sound recorder. Ah, so the audio recorder is a quick tool to say um, I want to record my voice because I'm going to use the mouth plugin later or the exposure sheet. So let's say I say something meaningful. In a perfect world, everybody would speak Klingon. All right, we can save that and play it. All right, and there it is. So that's a, a tr an audio track that we can use in the mouth plugin to then start drawing uh, perhaps uh, facial expressions or the shape of the mouth based on what's being said in the phonemes. So that's uh, another tool somewhere here, uh, also under utilities. There. So there is the sound recorder. The media player is another little gadget that we have here. If you have a an AVI file you want to play quickly you can go and open it and here's one for instance that I, I created in Dog Waffle and you can play it right there. It also plays the audio track if there is one. Okay, <coughs> There are a few other features in there but I think we're running out of time so let's go and explore a few more. Uh, let's see the widgets. Calendar just so you know what day it is today. Is it tax time yet? Uh huh. Uh, let's see. Utilities. Uh, preview a DWA. So that one's a, a media player specifically for the DWA file. So now keep in mind DWA or dog waffle animation is essentially a native format for a dog waffle. If you have a spaceship in DWA format, you can play it here in a separate standalone preview. Right, so that uh, allows you to see it just in its uh, initial frame. You get some additional information here. Let's say the width, the height. You need to know how many frames it contains. Um, and then some other information. So <coughs> you can see here, play it. Um, I think there is an option here. Oh yeah, it's just tumbling very slowly. Okay, so <coughs> if you if you set the delay to a smaller value, it will animate a little bit faster, right? And if you set it to a very small value, there you go. So uh, that's a quick uh, DWA preview. It's essentially something you could use to uh, take a look at it before you decide to load it, right? If you go to open, um, that will allow you to load the animation just the same way. And here is, in fact, an animation courtesy of uh, Daniel Beck or Dartenbeck. Um, some 3D animation 
that we used in some tutorials in the past. This one actually is a slower version than the original where we applied the motion prediction module to slow it down. And so it does tumble a little bit slower. All right, so let's see. I think we've reached the end of the um, where is it utilities menu. <coughs> yep, we went to the widgets, and there is one more, the save localization string table. Now here is one for those who want to make their own language version of all these menus. Right, all these menu items here in English, um, but let's say you want to make a German version, or a French, or a Swahili, or a Klingon version. There you go. That's a mission in life. Um, save localization string table will save the information of all of the dialogues, all of these menus that have been visited. It will save all that in a file that you can then uh, open in um, a text editor such as, I think, the, the RTF uh, editor or WordPad, and <coughs> perhaps even a Notepad. I don't know. I haven't looked at that lately. But you can uh, then start converting the text strings to a different language. And then next time um, the program starts, if you have that la localization string table in the dog waffle folder, it will um, it will use it, and you'll have translated menus. Now <coughs> there is uh, another group of options still to explore. This one here. Uh, so we've just finished the utilities. Let's go down to other, and there are a few more. So here is an alpha panel. What the alpha panel is is um, sort of a uh, another way to look at all of the options that we have here on the selection mask. Right, we have clear alpha. All of these we used to have uh, when you right clicked on the um, the items here. Actually we still do. Okay, so that's basically what that is. You can right click on these alpha selection tools basically and it will open the alpha options. So the alpha uh, panel. Right, so all of these choices, such as inverting the alpha, storing alpha, same thing, um, all of these you can basically get to from the alpha panel. We just have a shortcut to it here in case you want to quickly open that without actually going to the uh, alpha or the selection tools. Um, <coughs> sometimes that's really a, a handy way to do something like this. Here you have the drop shadow, you have the alpha glow, and you have the emboss by alpha and you want to just apply that with one click. So that's good to have that alpha options right there. And um, let's say what else? Oh, we have the media manager. So the media manager is an older version of uh, what later became the media browser, uh, where you can manage your, your brushes. And you see there are many, many brushes here now. These are all of the uh, pre-built, predefined media brushes that come with the program, plus perhaps a few more that I may have saved since then. Um, but they are kind of uh, disorganized. It's not uh, a pretty picture here. Um, it's uh, it's all together in the same bucket. And so that was an initial uh, version of the media browser. And what we what we decided eventually is that okay, that's good, but we really need also something a little bit more powerful to organize. And when you go to the brush tool and you look at browse media, you actually have a more um, structured environment now where you see these images all at the same time. So you can pin it down, you can pin it down here, and then um, look at, uh, for instance, the favorites collection, and you have the brush you can pick and you can paint with it. You have another brush you can pick and you, have, you can paint with that. And so that's how that goes, is you, you have now many different brushes uh, at the tips of your mouse, I guess, <laughs> at your fingertips, uh, and uh, easily accessible. But uh, for I guess for historical or emotional reasons, we still keep this one here. It's a, it's a good reminder to, to see that uh, thing. It, it takes time to develop software. Uh, this, this is, what, 12 years in the making. And uh, let's move on to the next, the zoom panel. Uh, the good old zoom panel is another way to uh, zoom in or out into your image here uh, with a couple of presets. If you want to click so to some uh, preset zoom factors here, uh, sometimes that might be a very nice way to do that. There are, of course, other ways to zoom in and out. Let me get rid of the clock here uh, and this as well. So uh, other ways to zoom in are right here. You click and drag 
uh, no, this one here will reset it to 100%. This one here is click and drag. So zoom in and out, you just like go like this. Right? So you click and then start dragging. You don't click and let go of the mouse, you just click and drag right here. The moment you click, it actually moves your mouse to the center. Keep an eye on the center. I'm going to click here, boom, and the, the mouse button, the cursor is now in the middle. And then you can go sideways to zoom in um, or out. And there is also here fit the screen. And um, this one here has reset it to 100% un unzoomed. All right, let's see one more um, category, two, two more. Text panel, that one's uh, kind of uh, similar to the text tool here. So if you, if you select the text tool, you see that you are here now, and you can type in your text. And if you right click on it, um, <coughs> you don't really get that text panel anymore. But uh, if, you, if you want to have that text panel, you can still actually see it here. It's basically something you have, I think, over here somewhere. Let me try to remember. Um, well, let's just go back to it and use it as is. So the text panel is here, and that's basically giving you some of these options that you will see now. Nowadays, it's really in the context bar here at the top. That's what it is, right? So you have options to apply the text. So if you, if you make this text, and maybe we'll make it a little bit bigger, it's easier to see that way. Let's go to a uh, bigger uh, and different font. Some of the nice looking fonts. There you go. Um, and here is the text. And what I'll do is I'll let's first erase the background here. Let's erase it to dark. So right click and black. There you go. So I'm going to select the light color and then I'm going to apply text. That's the same you see here, right? Apply text, I'm going to click here, and that's basically doing just that. So what you see here, this text panel is, in the, in the olden days, we had just this floating tool to, uh, to do all these things that we now also have in the, um, the context bar, right? So we have show the box again, there it is, show text box, and it comes back at the same location, and maybe this time we'll actually convert it to a brush, so there's an option here somewhere to make brush there make brush and so now we have it in a brush and if we take the uh the brush tool and enable the preview there prv click that to enable the preview you now see it as a brush and you can paint with that and with the right button or left button and other colors um or not um so <laughs> there's uh a number of different ways to use that uh, once it's a brush and as we saw in another uh, animation in another video you can also use it to um, do all sorts of uh, animated effects with that all right so that's the um, the the brush panel i think there was one more and that's on the other the error console you know uh, if the program has any sort of errors or generates any sort of diagnostics this might be interesting to see um, you can uh, explore that and uh, see if that can help you if you have any sort of issues uh, on your particular computer. All right, I think we've gone through the utilities, we've gone through colors, we've gone through other. There are a few more here. We'll take that uh, look right now. Planet, uh, tablet options. That is actually something very similar uh, to what you see here to set the tablet. That is the same thing. To set the tablet, let me get rid of the uh, preview and set a different brush. There. Um, if you're looking at the tablet, there it is. Tablet pressure adjustment. Um, that's basically something that you'll want to use if you have a tablet and you want to adjust the pressure. With the uh, mouse, that won't really help you much. Um, and I'm using a mouse right now here. All right, let's see uh, what else we have. Tablet reinitialize. And let's see what else. Rescue off-screen windows. Uh, ah, sometimes you move windows, like this one here, this floating panel, or let's say here, the settings panel, if you pin it down. Um, and you may, maybe it's disappearing. Maybe you can't find it anymore. And uh, it may be because it went off-screen. That can happen for two reasons I can think of. One is something broke in your registry and um, it's now containing a position that's actually placing it off screen. Another one is that you may have changed the screen resolution and if you do that, 
the screen resolution is now maybe much lower than it used to be. So if this one was already close to the edge, and now you have a much lower screen resolution, it is definitely off the edge of the screen. And so in order to recover that, what we do is we go look for all of the windows that are somewhat floating outside and uh, reposition it. So rescue this will typically reposition the windows that are not currently visible because they are off screen. Now if they are invisible because they are turned off, that should not ac uh, affect that. But uh, anything that uh, was moved too far out of the view, uh, it, uh, there's a good chance you'll be able to recover it that way. And last one here, detect the screen DPI. And that one we have because um, we like it to be at 96. Um, we have some users that set it way higher, 120 or so. And sometimes you do get some artifacts, uh, some extra space around the icons or some fonts that are looking different and it can throw things off a little bit. So this uh, is a little bit of a diagnostic message that you might find useful at times. All right, well, I think that completes this. This is a very long tutorial. I should have warned you, but uh, <laughs> um, I had to go through this to uh, kind of refresh my memory on some of these uh, features that I haven't visited in quite a while. All right, thanks for watching and happy painting.